have two more messages to go, and we'll be wrapping up. Thus far, we have talked about being an unshakable people. And in order to be an unshakable people, in order to have an unshakable kingdom, we've talked about being a people of pressure, being a people of patience, perseverance, being a people who's aware of even our own pride. We had two messages, one about uh, King Nebuchadnezzar, the other one about Belshazzar, and talked about how we should not be a people of pride. We've talked about being a people of persecution, how the church undergoes certain uh, tragedies, certain circumstances, certain trials that makes us stronger, right? When you go through tough stuff and you come out on the other side victorious, you're a stronger person for it. We've also talked about being a people of power, uh, resting on the power of God, how he's in control, how God is sovereign. And we've also talked about being a people of persistence. When things are going well, when things are going tough, keep moving forward. Don't give up. We talked about that last week. Today, we are going to be talking about being a people of prayer. Being a people of prayer. So if you have your Bibles, turn to Daniel chapter 9 for one of the uh, greatest prayers in the entire Bible. And if you want to read other great prayers, you can go to, and this is a little memory for you, you can go to Daniel 9, Ezra 9, or Nehemiah 9. Three of the greatest prayers in all of the Bible. Daniel 9, Ezra 9, Nehemiah chapter 9. But we're going to be in Daniel chapter 9 today. One of the earliest, I guess you could say, feelings, introductions I really ever had with prayer was in church. I don't remember being raised to pray. I can remember, I grew up in a broken home, my parents were divorced, and I can remember sitting around the dinner table, my mom asking me to pray, and every single time I would say no. I would say no because I was really embarrassed and I just didn't really want to pray, even though I had, I had grown up in church. And so as I kind of got a little bit more comfortable with church, I grew up in a little old small country town Christian church, maximum people were about 60. We had green pews and purple carpet, so it was really stylish. And my grandfather had installed these, I guess you would say, light covers that were in the in American flags. <laughs> and, so, and so it was a God and country type of church. And we never knew who was going to come up and serve the Lord's Supper. It would just be whoever wanted to stand up and volunteer required four men. And so you'd, you'd look around. It was really awkward. You'd wait for somebody to stand up. If nobody stood up, you would get up and go do it. And so one Sunday, I stood up, walked up front. We got the Lord's Supper, and we started passing it around. And I would always take this side, and I always forgot. We had, this, we had this lady in our church. She struggled with Parkinson's disease. And so, I mean, she would shake, and she wasn't able to stop. And so it was so precious just being able to take the Lord's Supper and serve it to her because she couldn't hold the cup of juice. She would shake. And so you got to serve her the Lord's Supper every Sunday, and she was really a wonderful, wonderful woman. But... After we served the Lord's Supper, we'd go back up front, and the person who was leading the music would call on a random member to pray. And everybody could hear it, because it's a small church, right? And so he asked me to pray. He goes, Rick, will you pray for our offering? And I said, no. <laughs> it was really embarrassing, but I did not want to pray. I was this teenager. I knew I was defiantly living in sin, uh, and so I just kind of felt like it was the wrong thing to do, you know, is to pray, and so I just straight up told him no, and he said, that's all right, buddy, one day you'll be able to pray, and, uh, and so I remember that, I'll never forget that for as long as I live, but it was that I was about 16 years old when I told him no, I wouldn't pray, and as I continued, you know, to live my life as a kid, I began to fall in love with Jesus, and uh, the next time he asked me to pray, I did pray, and uh, I was actually very humbled in that moment. God was working on my heart, and so I knelt before uh, the, the Lord's table, and I offered up a prayer, and it was just a really kind of uh, a moment of, of turning in my life when I really wanted to experience God and to know him, and that's what prayer is. Prayer is simply talking to God. It's God talk, and that's where we find ourselves in Daniel chapter 9. Daniel's talking to God, and we are about 538 B.C. It's, it's in the first year of a king called Darius. This is Darius II, not Darius I that we talked about a few weeks ago. And Daniel is in a really breaking po point in his life. Daniel was about 20 years old when he was taken from, Babylon, or from Israel to Babylon, and so he's a captive. And at this point in Daniel's life, he's almost 90 years old, right? In the ancient world... You would be lucky to live really into your 50s. You were considered a really old person if you were 50 years old. 60s and 70s, if you could reach 80s, you were blessed by God is what the Bible teaches. And here is Daniel pushing 90. He has survived Babylon. He has survived Persia. And the guy just will not give up. He's being tossed before lions. He's been threatened with death. And so this guy is a warrior for the Lord. 
And so Daniel is really excited, but his heart is also convicted because he's reading the words of a prophet named Jeremiah. And Jeremiah told Israel that Babylon was coming and you're going to be in Babylon for 70 years. And so if Daniel was about 20 and he's pushing 90, Daniel has almost reached the point when Israel's captivity would be over. They would be able to return to the promised land, their homeland, to rebuild Jerusalem. And Daniel has reading the scroll of Isaiah, and his heart is so convicted, and, and then he just bursts out into this prayer. And so I think it's really, really powerful that the reason why Daniel was praying is because he's reflecting on Scripture. Look at Daniel chapter 9, starting in verse 2. He's talking about in the first year of the reign of Darius. And he says, I, Daniel, understood from the Scriptures. I was reading my Bible according to the word of the Lord given to Jeremiah the prophet, that the desolation of Jerusalem would last 70 years. I was meditating on this prophecy of Jeremiah, he says. And so in verse 3 he says, So I turned to the Lord and pleaded with him in prayer and petition and fasting and in sackcloth and ashes. In other words, Daniel says, It was reading the Bible that convicted my heart, that prepared me in order to approach God and to pray to him. And one of the customs that they would do is they would take off their comfortable clothes and they would put on what's called sackcloth. Really itchy, really uncomfortable. It would be like wearing burlap or like one of the old like potato sacks, right? Cutting out the hole in the top and putting your arms through. Can you imagine how uncomfortable that would be? Because they wanted God to have their attention. They would also rub themselves with ashes and they would approach themselves physically in order to present themselves before God, in order to pray. And that's exactly what Daniel was doing. And so one of the encouragements that I want to give you this morning is simply this. We should pray after reading scripture in order to focus on our behavior. That's what Daniel does here. Daniel is getting ready to focus on his behavior because Daniel knows he is a sinner. He messes up, he makes mistakes. And that's a big aspect of prayer, isn't it? When we're talking to God, we're not only talking to God about who he is, but we're also talking to God about ourselves, about what we have done and who we are and what God can do for our future. And that all starts in preparing your heart by reading the Bible. I want to give you some encouragement that if you are going to pray to God, start off with reading scripture. Scripture, the Bible, is one of the greatest inspirations that can move your heart to position your spirit with the right attitude and the right mindset before you approach God. Paul put it like this in the book of Hebrews chapter 4. He says the word of God is living and active and sharper than any two-edged sword. It peers as far as the division of the soul and the spirit. So in other words, Paul says the things that are impossible to divide, God's word is so powerful that it can divide the impossible. And then he gives another illustration. As both joints and marrow, able to judge the thoughts and the intentions of the heart. And so Daniel here is reflecting on the word of God and with the word fresh in his mind and his heart humbled by his own sin, he approaches God with one of the most incredible prayers that we find in scripture. Look at verse four. He says, I prayed to the Lord my God and I confessed and said, alas, O Lord, the great and awesome God who keeps his covenants and loving kindness for those who love him and keep his commandments. I think one of the greatest aspects of Daniel's prayer is that he remembers who God is. I don't know about you, but sometimes life can change my perspective of God. When life is going great, what is God? He's awesome. He's powerful. He's wonderful. Thank you, God, for being so good to me. But when life stinks, when you've lost your job, when your retirement account has crashed, when you've misplaced money, when you're fighting with your husband or your wife, when your kids have gone astray, all of a sudden you look up to God as maybe mean-spirited and angry and judgmental and maybe he wants the worst for you. And that's what happens in life. Sometimes our life circumstances and situations changes our perspective of God. But yet after all that Daniel had been through, he never lost sight of who God was. God, you are awesome. God, you are powerful. God, you are good and you are righteous. And so in other words, Daniel in his prayer life recognizes and trusts God and what he was doing to Daniel because he trusted who God was. Daniel trusted the hand of God in his life because Daniel trusted the heart of God. God is righteous. God is good. And if you are going through something difficult or painful or tragic, God is not willing that you should suffer and leave him because God never does anything evil. 
And so Daniel was focusing and remembering about who God is, a great and awesome God who keeps his covenant and gives mercy to those who obey him. But Daniel knew all too well. Look at, look at what Daniel goes into here in, in Daniel chapter 9, verses 5 through 6. I think this is incredibly powerful because if you've been with us any time throughout this series, you will know that Daniel is, for the most part, he's a really good man. He loves God. He does what is right. He's not a bad person, as we would think. Daniel lives his life by the book. He is fearless. He doesn't back down. But look at what Daniel does. Daniel takes responsibility for the sin of his people. He says in verse 5, we have sinned. We've committed iniquity. We have acted wickedly, and we have rebelled, even turning aside from your commandments and your ordinances. Moreover, we have not listened to your servants, the prophets. Not only have we sinned, God, but we don't even listen to what you have to say. Who spoke in your name to our kings and our princes, our fathers, and all the people of the land. I think this is incredibly powerful. This is like the father, the head of the house, taking responsibility for his family. This is like the leaders of the church taking responsibility for the status of their people. Even though Daniel isn't guilty, Daniel says, God, I am a sinner, and this is where we are, and this is what we have done. That's awesome. It takes a really strong man to take responsibility for his own actions, but it takes an even stronger man to take responsibility for the actions of others. You see, it was Israel's sin that deceived them into thinking that they could get along without God. And if we are not careful, and this is what Daniel's reflecting on, if we are not careful, we can actually be tricked by our own sin. Well, it's, it's really somebody else's problem for where I'm at in my relationship with God. What's well, the church? The church doesn't do things X, Y, and Z how I like it. And so because we don't reach out enough, we don't reach in enough, because the music's played this way, because the, the building's designed that way, it's, it's everyone else's problem of where I'm at and why I don't serve and why I struggle with my sin. Well, if only my husband would be different. If only my wife would submit. If only my children would obey. And we can convince ourselves that our sin problem is the problem of everyone else. But Daniel was very emphatically clear. God, we and we alone are responsible. And he starts off with scripture. You see, reading scripture with an active prayer life keeps us away from the tricks of sin. We won't be deceived by our own sinfulness. Look what Paul writes again in Hebrews chapter 3. He says, take care, brethren, that there not be any among you who are, uh, have an unbelieving, evil heart that falls away from the living God, but encourage one another day after day as it is still called today so that none of you will be hardened by the deceitfulness of sin. One of the reasons why people stop coming to church And this isn't to say that the church is perfect or that leaders never make mistakes. But more often than not, one of the reasons why people stop attending church is because they're tricked by their own sin. They fall into the trap of the devil. They get convinced that the church is their enemy and everyone has it out for them. And sin so easily ensnares them and prevents them from having a relationship with God. And that's one of the reasons why I love Christmas. It's because Christmas reminds us that God has goodwill for us, that he loves us that it is God's purpose and plan for our life that we would be in a relationship with him. But it must start with us taking responsibility of our behavior. You see, when we allow sin to easily trick us, we will fall away from Christ. Our hearts do get hardened. And we can reflect on the character of others rather than our own character. And so Daniel starts off by focusing on his behavior, which inevitably leads to character. He focuses on what we have done as a people, with it, which then shifts to who I am. You see, we are not just people who do things that are sinful. We are people who are sinners. Every single person in this room is a sinner. We make mistakes. Let's admit it. Daniel admits it. But it was Israel's hardened heart that somehow convinced them that they were doing right by God, even though they were living in sin. And so Daniel erupts here. He moves from focusing on the sinful behavior to now focusing on the character of God and himself. Look at verse 7. He says, righteousness belongs to you, O Lord, but to us open shame. As it is this day to the men of Judah, the inhabitants of Jerusalem, and all of Israel, those who are nearby and those who are far away, and all the countries to which you have driven them because of their unfaithful deeds, which they have committed against you. Daniel says, look, we've messed up, God. 
you have been good to us, you have been faithful, you are righteous, but we are the people who have made the mistake. He says in verse 8, open shame belongs to us, O Lord, to our kings, to our princes, to our fathers, because we have sinned against you. To the Lord our God belongs compassion and forgiveness, for we have rebelled against him. In other words, Daniel says it was our leadership. It was our spiritual leaders. It was our people that got us to this point. But God, you have always done right by us. And frankly, God, you've given us what we deserve. That's a really hard thing to admit, isn't it? Isn't it hard to admit that you're wrong? I struggle with pride. There is no doubt about it. One of the things I hate the most is admitting to Angel that I am wrong. (laughs) It's true. In fact, when I came on staff here, one of my references that I put down told the leaders, he said, Rick will often fight and not admit that he's wrong, but eventually he comes back around. And Angel can testify to that, right? Maybe three weeks or so I'll come around and I'll say, hey, Hunter, you remember that three weeks ago? I was wrong. She'll say, it's about time, you know what I'm saying? I'm kidding. I'm really not that prideful. (laughs) Thanks. And so he says, look, we've rebelled against God. We are prideful. We, We have sinned against you. And he reflects on God's holiness and God's character. And look at verse 10. He says, nor have we obeyed the voice of the Lord our God to walk in his teachings that he set before us through his servants and the prophets. God even said, look, I'm going to make it easy for you. I'm going to write it down. And then you can look and you can read it. And you can remember what it is that I want you to do. And even though God writes it down and makes a list for us, right, we still mess up and forget. It's like when Angel sent me to Costco. Now, this was about seven years ago, okay? I absolutely do not do this at all, ever. Angel sends me to Costco with a list of things that she wants me to get. It has to do with, like, lame stuff like pictures and food and, you know, healthy stuff. And so I go to Costco, and I just get overwhelmed by the wonderfulness of Costco. And so I came home with syrup and pancakes, and I didn't come home with anything that she sent me to get. And she was like, where is my stuff? And I was like, I forgot. I cannot believe I forgot your stuff. She's like, Rick, I wrote you a list. Now she's evolved, okay? Now she actually sends me pictures of stuff. (laughs) And if I work hard enough, I won't have to go to the grocery store at all in the future. You know what I mean? That's my goal, not to have to go to the grocery store. And so God is like, look, Daniel's like, you even wrote it down for us, and we still didn't get it right. And he says in verse 11, he says, indeed, all Israel has transgressed your law and turned aside, not obeying your voice. So the curse has been poured out upon us, along with the oath which was written in the law of Moses, the servant of God, for we have sinned against him. When Moses gave the Old Testament law, the Israelites promised, they said, Moses, God, we promise you, we will keep this. And God says, if you don't, a curse is going to come upon you. Nations will take you over, and that's exactly what happened. And so Daniel was even looking back a couple hundred years to the law of Moses, taking responsibility for his people. He says in verse 12, thus he has confirmed his words which he had spoken against us, against our rulers who ruled us, to bring on us great calamity. For under the whole heaven there has not been done anything like that which was done to Jerusalem. I find this fascinating, that God disciplines even his own people. And usually that discipline is far much worse and far much more severe than the people of the world who aren't God's people. Why do you think that is? It's the same reason why parents discipline their children and not the children of others. It's a reflection of love. It's a reflection of care. It's a reflection that God wants a relationship with you, that he cares about your future. Only a parent who doesn't discipline their kids would actually hate their kids. And so he reflects here and he says, God, you have disciplined us. And when people look at Jerusalem, they say, wow, if that could happen to the people of God, what will happen to somebody like me? And so he says in verse 13, as it is written in the law of Moses, all this calamity has come upon us, yet we have not sought the favor of the Lord, our God, by turning away from our iniquity, giving attention to your truth. Isn't this the exact opposite of what discipline is supposed to be? He says, even when God disciplines us, we only made things worse. Isn't it weird how we continue to make the same stupid mistakes after we've received the penalty of our own sin? You make the wrong investment, you bought the wrong thing, you said the wrong words, 
And what happens next time, husbands and wives, you get in a fight and your emotion takes the best of you? You say the words again and you make things worse, right? Not that I'm speaking from experience here, okay? But we do this. Sometimes we don't learn from our mistakes. And that's what Daniel says. Even when it was so obviously clear, God, that we were sinning against you, we doubled down on our sin. That's what Daniel admits. He says in verse 14, Therefore the Lord has kept the calamity in store and brought it upon us. For the Lord our God is righteous with respect to all the deeds that he has done, but we have not obeyed his voice. God did the right thing. God punished us. God rebuked us that we might respond in faith, but yet we still didn't do right by God is what Daniel says here. Now he admits two things. And you could probably resonate with this because I certainly do. First of all, Daniel says we committed the sin of omission. There are two types of sins that you can commit. The sin of omission, which means you don't do what you know God wants you to do. Repent and be baptized. You don't do that. Walk in the fruit of the Spirit. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, faithfulness, self-control. You don't do that. Have compassion, love, mercy, grace with other people, forgiving one another, Jesus says. As God God has forgiven you, you don't do that. You omit yourself from doing the righteous things that you know God wants you to do. That's the sin of omission. And then he says, we've done sins of commission, which, as you can see, these are sins that you commit. It's not only not doing the things that God wants you to do, but it's doing the things that God doesn't want you to do. God says don't lie, you lie. God says don't steal, you steal. God says don't do X, Y, and Z, and we actually do them. And so Daniel takes absolute, total, full responsibility, not only for what he and his people had not done, but for what he and his people had done. And he says, you know what, God? I deserve it. I get it. I deserve it. I not only have done sinful things, but he shifts and says, I am a sinful person. And it's only when we reach that type of humility where we admit, God, I am wrong, we can be saved. You can't get a saved person saved until you get somebody lost. You can't be found until you realize that you're lost. And so Daniel, if Jeremiah's prophecy is going to come true, and after 70 years the people of God would go back to their homeland, if Daniel's prophecy is going to come true, Daniel has to admit, and it is a really hard thing to admit, I am lost. We have been lost as a people. God, would you be faithful and true and make us found? Bring us back. Bring us back to the homeland. Complete your words, in other words. And so he summarizes in verse 15. And now, O Lord our God, who have brought your people out of the land of Egypt with a mighty hand and have made a name for yourself, as it is this day we have sinned and we have been wicked. Simply put, we have done sinful things, we are a sinful people, and with a broken heart he takes responsibility for his actions. And this really is a sign of Christian maturity right, for us today, taking responsibility for our own actions, not trying to put off our failures, our misgivings, our fights, our sin off on other people. Look, it is no one else's responsibility for your relationship with God than you. I, even though I preach, am not going to stand before God for your responsibility. Only you are. It's the same thing for me. And so each of us must take our own responsibility and and come to the conclusion that even though we are saved, we are still sinners and we need God. Paul put it like this in 1 Timothy. It is a trustworthy statement, deserving full acceptance, that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners. And look what he says here. Among whom I am the foremost of all. The Apostle Paul, one of the greatest uh, greatest men in, in Christianity, admits, look, I'm a sinner but I need a savior. And so our recognition of our sin will reflect in our attitude and our actions. Let me put it to you like this, husbands. If you remember that you are a sinner and you make mistakes and you are not the perfect husband, when your wife offends you and hurts you, how is that information going to impact how you approach her in conversation? How about you wives? When you remember that you've not been the greatest wife when you've disrespected your husband, when you've messed up and made mistakes, how is that type of information, the recognition that you make mistakes, going to impact how you approach your husband? How about in the church? Maybe somebody hurts your feelings, things aren't going your way, Uh, there's a certain thing that the church does that you don't agree with. How does remembering that I am a sinner and I've made mistakes impact how you treat people in the church? 
How about even in the world? And this is the biggest one. How does remembering that you are a sinner as you interact with the people of the world change your attitude and your action towards them? It's wrapped up in one word, humility. Hey, honey, you really hurt me and I feel really disrespected and I know I'm not the greatest husband and I know I've made my fair share of mistakes, but I just really needed to talk to you about this. Hey, honey, I know I haven't been the greatest wife. I've made mistakes. I know that I'm not perfect, but this really bothers me. I really feel unloved. You go through the check line out at a store, you have no idea what that person is going through. Maybe they're struggling with cancer. Maybe their daughter just passed away. Maybe their parents just died. Maybe their son has leukemia. We just don't know what people are going through. But one thing we do know, we are sinners. We make mistakes, and we need mercy. And if we have that type of attitude, it will dynamically change how we interact with other people. We will start seeing people through the lens of mercy and grace rather than entitlement and anger. And that's what Daniel sees. And so when he focuses on his behavior and he reflects on his character, ultimately Daniel knows that I am in desperate need of a savior. I read an article not too long ago of why people don't like to come to church One of the reasons why, maybe this is your first time here and you're like, dang, man, I feel pretty bad about myself today. (laughs) We don't always beat ourselves up, okay, when we're in church. Uh, And you're not really as bad as, as what you think you are, right? But whenever we come to church and we focus on the fact that, man, we've messed up, we've made mistakes, we are sinners, we get to reflect on the glorious aspect of the gospel. And that's what Daniel does, the fact that we have a Savior who even saw us at our worst point in human history and yet chose to love us anyways. That's awesome. That is good news. I mean, think about it, husbands and wives. If you would have really have known your spouse, knowing everything you know about them now, would you still have chosen to marry them? Maybe yes, maybe no. I mean, think about this. If you would have bought the house, right? If you would have known everything about the house that you live in now, all its flaws and its mistakes, all the things that you've had to done, would you still have bought it? I mean, we think about this all the time, right? Having all that information about the other person or about the thing really may change what we would have done in the, in the future. But yet God sees us when we are broken, disabled, tragic, sinful, evil, and yet he still looks at us and he says, I love that person and I'm going to die for them. That is incredible. And so Daniel says this in verse 16. He says, O Lord, in accordance with all of your righteous acts, let now your anger and your wrath turn away from the city of Jerusalem, your holy mountain. For because of our sins and the iniquities of our fathers, Jerusalem and your people have become a reproach to all of those around us. He says, look, God, it was because of these sins that brought us to this point. But God, change your mind. Keep your promise. Let us go back. He says, so now, God, listen to the prayer of your servant and to his supplication. A supplication, the difference between a prayer and a supplication, a prayer is God, is God talk, but a prayer of supplication is casting yourself on God's mercy and his grace. God, I know I don't deserve it, but would you please? And he says, do it not for my sake, not because I deserve it. Look what he says, do it for your sake, O Lord. Let your face shine on your desolate sanctuary. The the temple that was destroyed by the Babylonians, God, bring it back. Even though it doesn't deserve to be brought back, God, bring it back. We need your mercy. We need your grace. He says, oh my God, incline your ear and hear. You ever feel like that? God, would you just listen to me? I know I'm a knucklehead. I know I make mistakes. I know I don't deserve it. Just give me another chance. Open your eyes, Lord, and see the desolation of the city which is called by your name. For we are not presenting our supplications before you on account of any merits of our own, but on account of your great compassion. You know, when I was talking with my friends in high school and I fell in love with Jesus and I began to explain to them the gospel, one of my friends tried to rationalize why he doesn't need to go to church. He says, look, I'm a good person. I don't steal. I don't lie that much. I haven't murdered anyone. I'm a good person. He attempted to justify himself before God by the things that he has done. Yet the Bible says in Romans 3.23, all have fallen sin and, and have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. We are sinners, man. We make mistakes. And we can't approach God by saying, look, God, I, I really haven't been that bad, so would you please help me out here? We approach God saying, look, I know I deserve absolutely nothing, but God, 
be compassionate and gracious to me. He says in verse 19, O Lord, hear. O Lord, forgive. O Lord, listen and take action. For your own sake, my God, do not delay because your city and your people are called by your name. God, would you please give us compassion? Would you please give us grace? That's the kind of prayer that Daniel prayed. And God moved and God acted. He says in verse, uh, the following verses, uh, he talks about the 70 weeks, which we're not getting into the, this morning, where God says, look, what you're going through is not going to last forever. It's going to be hard. It's going to be difficult. But grace is coming. Grace is coming. And isn't it good news that the Bible says in Ephesians chapter 2, verse 8, for by grace you have been saved through faith, not of yourselves. It is the gift of God. 1 John 3, verse 1 says, Behold what manner of love the Father has bestowed on us that we should be called the children of God. And it is only by God's grace that we are who we are. I'm no better than you. You're no better than I am. It's not because I'm a preacher, I'm in the ministry, that I get any more grace or any more salvation or any more crowns than you get. It is only by God's grace that we are saved. Daniel remembered that. And that's something that I want you to walk away with this morning, with that type of encouragement. God, give me your grace. Give me your compassion. Give me your mercy. Bring me back to you, God. Let me have a relationship with you again. And so the question that I ask you, ask you this morning is, do you find yourself to be a sinner in need of a Savior? And everybody in this room, hopefully, Lord willing, who hasn't been too hardened by their sin should say, yes, God, I need to be saved. Well, I've got good news for you. If you've obeyed the gospel and you've been baptized into Christ, the Bible says this. If we say that we have sin, or if we say that we have no sin, we are deceiving ourselves and the truth is not in us. But if we confess our sins, he is faithful and he is righteous to forgive us of all of our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. So if you're a Christian this morning and you've messed up, the good news is, is if you admit that you're a sinner in need of a savior, and you say, God, I give this to you. Would you give me your grace? God will give it to you. And he'll give it to you tomorrow. And he'll give it to you the next day. And he'll give it to you when you're ready to die and go in the grave. That's how good God's grace is. But if you're not a Christian, no matter what you do, no amount of works, no amount of asking, no amount of pleading, will ever be able to get you the grace of God. It is something that you have to accept as a free gift. The Bible says in Acts chapter 2, verse 38, when they cried out, men and brethren, what shall we do that we may be saved? He said, repent, turn away from your sins, and be baptized in the name of Jesus for the forgiveness of your sins, and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. And so if you have not obeyed the gospel, I want to encourage you to accept the gospel today, admit that you are a sinner in need of a Savior, and have a relationship with God that will last forever. Would you stand and let's pray. God, we approach to you this morning in humility and gratefulness and gratitude for the love that you have given us. And God, we certainly know that we do not deserve it. There's not a single person in this room who deserves your grace. But God, we thank you for it anyways and we accept it. God, I pray that everybody in this room will be humbled by the fact that we know that we've messed up. We know that we make mistakes. We know that we're not perfect. And God, may that change our actions and our attitudes towards one another, that we may be able to speak the truth in love, that we may be able to share your goodness in light of your grace, and that we take responsibility for our sin. Lord, we love you. We thank you. Thank you for Daniel. Thank you for him being a man of boldness and courage, willing to take responsibility not only for himself, but even for his own people. And God, we thank you for your fulfilled promises. We thank you for Jesus. Thank you for letting us become your children, Lord. It's in his name that we pray. Amen.